Welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Atlas Bowen. I'm Glenn McGowan. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about why the BMW E36 is the next best collector car. So the values of these things have been going up over the last couple of years, and I'm going to tell you why you should be grabbing one before it's too late. So if you don't know what an E36 is, it's a BMW 3 Series from 1992 to 1999. They came in a four-door sedan, two-door coupe, two-door convertible, a compact, and then later a Z3 Roadster, which is essentially an E36 chassis. So behind me are two examples, one that's in really good shape and the other one that's essentially on the chopping block and is in very, very poor condition. So I'm going to go over what to look for if you're buying one of these things. And then we're also going to look at the problems that these things have, which kind of are driving up the price, why there's so many of them going off the road every year. So let's get into it. This week's video is brought to you by LCO BMW Parts. Visit our online store for E36, E46, and E90 parts, or follow us on Instagram at LCO BMW. All the links are in the description below. So when I started my BMW parts business 14 years ago, the E36 is essentially all we did for a while. And then every once in a while we would get an E30. So I watched the E30 go from a car that was not really on the road to a really sought after collectible, especially nice condition, low mile ones. And I also watched the E36 over the last 14 years go from a car that was everywhere all the time to like really kind of hard to find out. And seeing nice ones on the street is very kind of rare, unless you're on social media, seeing people's perfect garage kept ones you don't really see them that much anymore and that's kind of a good sign in my opinion of a car that has great collectability and great value moving forward especially the m3 models too they were once kind of like inexpensive and people were tracking them and beating the crap out of them essentially so there wasn't many of them on the road these cars became drift cars and race cars and a lot of people were just kind of taking them apart and they were getting wrecked and a lot of them were rotting out so there's not many really good good ones on the road anymore. So it's kind of driving the price up of these things. So that's kind of the main reason why I see the kind of trend of this collectability with these cars happening relatively fast over the last five years or so. So now I'm going to just talk about the models and the drivetrain options in these cars. So there's a 318, a 323, a 325, a 328, and an M3. So they came with four cylinders, 2.5s, which is in your 323 and your 325, 2.8, 328, and then your M3s, which is a three liter in 1995, and then a 3.2 liter in 1996 to 99 with the S52. So 92 to 95, you have your 318, which is an M42, and then you have your M50, which is the 2.5 liter, and then 1996 comes, it is OBD2. So now you have your 323, which is essentially a 2.5, and then your 328, which is a 2.8, which is a really popular engine, and then your S52. So that's kind of like the changes in the years. So all your four cylinder and your six cylinder 2.5s will have your Gitrag five speed. These are good transits, but, but second gear, synchros always grinding in second. It's such a popular thing. I actually have one come through here once that literally had a hole where second gear was supposed to be. There was nothing there, it was that bad. So that's like a common thing to look for with those transmissions. And then your S50 M3 engine, S52, and your 2.8 all had ZF five speeds. Now this is a really popular transmission. People are bolting these things up to LSs and they can hold a lot of power and it's a small, tiny package. And they're a really good transmission and they've really gained a lot of popularity recently so that's kind of essentially what you're looking for now a little rare things is that like the compact only had the four cylinder in it and then your z3 had from 1996 to 1998 uh, 2.5 and then a 2.8 but those blocks were aluminum because all the other ones are cast iron single van those blocks uh, so another just little weird thing too. So this 1992 here, that is the first and only year for a non Vanos M50 2.5 liter. And also every single 1992 that I've ever seen has a factory LSD posi rear in the back too. So if you didn't know that, that's a one good selling feature with those cars is because they all have like the cold weather package with an LSD. Now, a fun fact with the E36 is that you could have ordered a car with the cold weather package and had an LSD in it. So there's a lot of those cars floating around there that you wouldn't think would have a posi rear in it but it does because you could order that. But that stopped with the E46 model in 1999 and up. They got rid of that. And I think the only ones that had it was like the ZHP and the M3. So it's a good feature with these cars that you can get one with the Posi rear right from the factory. 
Okay, so let's look at the good condition car now. This is my 1999 M3. Okay, so my car is a 99 M3, like I said, it is a convertible, removable hardtop. Underneath, it has a soft top that's manually converted because the convertible motors and switches and modules all have a ton of problems. So that's a popular upgrade to do with the convertible models. Uh, the car has started its life as an automatic car, which is always a good thing because you're usually not beaten as bad. I five-speed swapped it years ago with the correct ZF Trans. So besides that, it's sitting on BC Racing coilovers. It's got like a strut bar in the front and then like a k and like cold air intake on there besides that it's essentially all original um, underneath the car it's super clean there's not a drop of rust underneath the thing I keep it indoors mainly to preserve its life I wouldn't say this is a perfect car by any means but it's a really good example of a nice driver quality car so we'll go over this thing real quick and then we'll go into that bad horrible one over there with all the rot holes all right so let's start under the hood okay so some problems are in there with the DME, the engine computer is, you'll get water in there and sometimes ruin your computer, uh, valve cover gaskets, I mean, the typical like plastic hose issues, boots, stuff like that. Sometimes these strut tops blow out, but they have reinforcements for that. But there you see my coilovers, strut bar, cold air intake. But other than that, that's what that looks like underneath there. Another problem these things have is when you get them overheated too much, the cylinder heads get cracks in them. So a lot of people say, oh, it needs a head gasket. But like nine out of 10 times, there's a crack in the cylinder head. So you definitely wanna watch the temperature gauge when you have one of these. Uh, they also have sometimes issues with the Vanas, but can be rebuilt. But other than that, these things are pretty strong. Okay, so in my opinion, the weakest link with these cars is the interior. So if anybody has one of these, they know exactly what I'm talking about. So door panels, specifically on the two-door cars, even the four-door ones fall apart, but two-door door panels, the way they're built, there is like these plastic mounts glued to the back of the panel. And when you try to pull the door shut sometimes, you take the whole door card off with you and all the mounts are on the door and you can take them off and they sell reproduction top mounts for it. And you gotta like epoxy them back on. So that's a really big thing. Same thing with the front of the glove box. Uh, the convertibles, the rear seats, because they're out in the weather, they get like super hard and brittle and then you sit in them, all the stitches crack. I guess that essentially would be a convertible thing for any car when you have the top down all the time but the seats rip and stuff like that but other than that the interior in these things is kind of like you know hit or miss but this one's actually in pretty decent shape so we'll take a look okay so this has the deluxe door cards that has the leather stitched insert there so this is kind of the big issue with these things. They get a little like delamination where the material is pulling off here, but this car has all the pockets and stuff like that in here. And it's just kind of pulling off a little bit. That's the M3 steering wheel on that car. It's like a giant pancake. This is digital climate control, 92 to 95, had the analog climate control. There's like three different type of onboard computers that come in all these models. Usually the front of the glove box falls off. But these are the M3 sport seats. As you can see, it's got the colors right there on the back bolster. But normal wear here. These are manual sport seats too, which makes them sport seats. It's essentially this piece here. You can tell the difference. That piece slides in and out. So this is the back seat here. So you can see the insert for the convertible there. That thing's kind of separating, which is kind of common. These are the M3 rear seats. The bottom is the same for all the cars, essentially, or all the convertible cars. But the back seat is the M3 specific one. And headrest and anti-rollover protection is also an option in these cars. This car does have the roll bars, if you look behind there. And this is the hard top, there's the latch there. And the install kit goes underneath that latch. So if you don't have the install kit, then the only thing holding on the front here is this one handle here. So that's why it's important if you ever buy 
There you go. If you ever buy an E36 hardtop, that you need to get the install kit for it. So I moved around the back of the car here. So a couple things that happened too are this trunk latch here, the metal around here gets cracked and broken from slamming the trunk a lot. So I know they make a plate to fix that or you have to like push it down and re-weld it. So that's something to look for that happens. Uh, the tail lights in these things. So they have this like bulb socket thing in the back and like a circuit board. And all the time they like burn through the circuit board or the sockets go bad or they don't fit right. So they have like a ton of issues. They do make aftermarket ones that have just the connector so you can just kind of plug your harness in there and all sorts of like clear and LED, all that fancy pants stuff too. But the factory ones have those little bulb sockets. There's like six or something on each tail light. So they do have some issues with that too. Uh, these cars also do have somewhat like subframe issues every once in a while they'll pull out. Not as big as the E46, but that's something to keep an eye on. You can buy the reinforcement plates like that too if you, you know, drive hard and stuff like that. But that's it for like the back of the car area. So a couple other little interior flaws with these cars are just starting with the door here, exterior door handles, the frame always breaks. So if you're having problems opening your door, 99% of the times it's the freaking handle frame on that handle breaks and you got to take it out from inside the door, take the door panel out, all that kind of stuff. The plastic clips for the window regulator, it has like a metal scissor window regulator. They will break and the window will move and stuff like that. And you'll have issues. So that's a really common thing. The four-door ones, a lot of the regulators actually get a crack in the metal and they flex, then break the clips, and then your window's all messed up. Little things like that. If you have power seats in your car, the recline gear is always the culprit. Usually when you're trying to recline your seat back, that little gear strips out and breaks. Uh, I actually have bought the ones from Dorman Products several times and they make a really good replacement gear that holds up. They have like cheap ones too that you can get, but you they don't fit right or they'll just get smoked out in like a week or two. So besides those little things like that that kind of come to mind right now are the only kind of like issues that you're gonna kind of run into with those things, but it's just super common. Like I said, the interiors kind of fall apart, which I'm gonna show you a really good example with this 92 here, what the interior looks like if you let it go. Oh, now to the fun part. Let's look at this thing and this is a perfect example of why so many of these are taken off the road. This thing is rotted out. Like all the chassis points are rotted out. They have like these jack pads that you put in there like from the factory to jack it up. I always take mine out because water builds up in there and moisture and it rots out that area. Once you get rot in the chassis, which happens all the time with these things, there's really nothing you can do. You're just chasing rust. Like you cut out some sheet metal because of the way the chassis is. It's not like a frame that you just section it out, put a new piece in. The floors go, all sorts of stuff like that. So the rust is like the biggest kind of issue with these because you can change the engine, you can change the trans, you can change the suspension. If it gets hit in the front, you can pull off the front frame rails. But if this thing's rotting out, there's nothing you can really do. So let's look at this thing. So this is missing because a part was already donated. So just some spots in like there. That's not good underneath there. And then these, you can see the rust starting to bubble and someone got creative here, but all in here, like this is the jacking point and underneath this thing, all this stuff is going in here. And that's exactly what you don't want. If you see this, a lot of these cars like this one had side skirts in it. And then once you take the side skirts off, a lot of times people put them on because the 92s didn't have them. So someone put these on, I think at some point. So someone puts this stuff on to cover off the rust here. So that, and then usually behind the front fenders here like this, this is actually, well, it's supposed to be part of the fender, but the fender goes underneath. I've seen fenders rot all the way up to here before, or at least have these holes down in here like that. So normal rust starting around the wheel well. These wheel wells actually aren't really bad, but they always get rust in here really bad, like that. The subframe and all that part of this is actually not in bad shape. It's mainly right around here. So sometimes you'll get a little bit of rust and stuff like that on this panel here. A lot of people think this is removable, but it is not. It's a part of the body. Like that. See, like that. Perfect example. Trunks sometimes rot out from the inside, but this one's actually not bad. But same thing here. It's like a look at repair here. There, it's all rotted there. And then again, like that. It's looking pretty good. Definitely not salvageable. That's why it's here. 
same thing there and then you can see someone try to repair this because all of that you can see the line someone tried to patch something in at some point because it's all rotted out from up there the one thing is nice about these cars if you did get in a front end collision the radiator support unbolts from the front frame rails and a lot of times the front bumper dips if you get in a light front end hit and the collision happens like over the frame rail so these don't get bent even if they do you can straighten them or cut them off weld new ones in and then you can just literally unbolt your whole front end like that down to that and then put all new parts back on and be up and running in like a day Okay, so the interior of this thing is like really gross, but it's a really good example to show you what happens to the interiors through time. That is like a completely delaminated door panel like that. That's what happens to them. This has no pockets at all. Like that, that's all gone. See, all this is separated. Some handy little screw there holding that thing on. These speakers normally break out of here. That's what the early model steering wheel looks like beautiful seat this is a manual seat this is a non-sport seat so it's like non-adjustable there so armrest and that's what i was talking about with the front of the glove box and the front of it is actually down here on the floor like that and just comes right off look at that it's just glued on so that's just like only a matter of time before that falls off the headliners and trim like this headliner is completely gone out of here but eight pillars, they delaminate, or the material comes off of those. Same thing with the headliners. It's just normal with kind of any car. And this early one, too, didn't even have an airbag. But you can see on that side, same thing with the door panel. So here are the rear inserts for the back panels there. And you can see they're just completely apart. That material just separates off of every square inch there. These are normally glued on, too. So these just completely fell off. The convertible ones actually slide in and out on like tabs that actually break too. This is, has the fold down rear seats, which is in terrible condition if you don't mind mold. So that's a lot of the ones that you'll come across that are like inexpensive that have been sitting for a while. That's kind of what that's going to look like in there and it's not good looking at all. Okay, so there you have it. Two examples of ones that are taken care of and one that's not been taken care of. So my opinion about these cars is this. The coupes are really hot, any one, even if it's a 318. A coupe in good condition is a really good car to kind of get after, but also essentially any car at this point that is not rotted out, the chassis is clean, that is a good car to snatch up because the lower the miles, the more money that thing's gonna be worth in the future. It's a really good car. It's a very raw car. It's definitely a driver's car. E46 got the interior a lot better. It's a lot more smoother of a car, which is also an amazing car, but the E36 is definitely a driver's car. That's why everybody likes these things. The E36, E46 chassis are like the last analog BMWs. So they are very simple and fun to own and fun to drive. So if you can get your hands on an M3 too, that's also a great investment too. I don't know if we'll ever be worth as much as like the E46 M3s or even the E30 M3s because there's not many E30 M3s that were made that are in the states here but the E36 M3 they made a lot of them uh, so there are four-door M3s convertible M3s two-door M3s but a lot of them are just been trashed or wrecked so that's a good car to snatch up now if you can find one anybody's seen like low mile ones you've seen the value of those things but if you can get one that's a good driver it's an awesome car to drive enjoy and hold on to for a while so that's just my opinion and if you can grab one of these while you can while they're still around so if you enjoyed the video, hit that like button. Thanks for watching.